freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode number 430 of Gun for Rhythm Radio, where we educate, we engage, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearmsauctions.com, where you set the price on guns, ammo, and accessories. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. Our theme today is conservative journalism, and our guest is Victoria Snitsar Churchill. Victoria is a writer and editor at American Liberty News and the Republican Standard, where she produces prolific coverage of news of the day with expert analysis on political developments and gun rights. Victoria has been featured on many media outlets, including The Washington Examiner, Forbes, CBS News, Time Magazine, The Blaze, and NRA TV. A proud immigrant and naturalized U.S. citizen, Victoria has held roles in numerous conservative grassroots efforts and is active to this day in Republican groups at all levels. Serving as a chairman of the Arlington Falls Church Young Republicans and the Virginia Common Committee Woman of the Young Republican National Committee. Wow. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> you make it sound so fancy. I promise I'm not that fancy. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a lot. Well, welcome to the show, Victoria. So glad to be here. I've followed you guys for years, and I know we've been friends kind of offline, behind the scenes, off camera for probably a good five years now. Now I'm finally on the show. I feel like I've made it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And the fact that, you know, your crazy busy schedule and mine, we have finally synced it up. That's that right there is a huge blessing. So um, thank you so much. And, you know, we... I really pared down all of the places that your work has shown up um, just for, for time and space, but you are prolific. I mean, you are constantly, how many articles do you write a minute? I mean, tell me. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> so honestly, nowadays I actually feel like I edit more than I write. So I'm, I like kind of publishing across different spaces because I feel like it helps me keep motivated and saying, oh, you know, this time I want to run something here. And I think this messaging would do a little bit better in this publication. Uh, so full time, I'm with American Liberty News and the Republican Standard. They're both offshoots of Evolution Digital Media, which is my full time employer. Um, but they're they're kind of gracious enough that they let me kind of stick my hands in a bunch of different things, which uh Working on the grassroots side of politics full time, I haven't always had that um, luxury. And so now that's kind of, I call it my fun time job is all of my involvement with young Republicans and things like that. I definitely still want to stay connected to the grassroots, even though I'm, you know, out here in D.C. and mm -hmm. hopefully not becoming a swamp creature. But mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, like I said, I kind of like to stay involved and especially within the Second Amendment space. I mean, that is just so reliant on grassroots and, um, you know, kind of I've always found and I know you guys are definitely of the same mindset with all the great work that you do with AMCON and organizations like that where uh, we kind of got to reconnect last year is that you know second amendment needs new voices and needs voices in new media as well and you know kind of whenever we can uh, connect those two that's a success in my book and I think in yours so I'm glad we get to do this today. Well I have a statement to say if I could yeah. Victoria I you know you're you're an immigrant and you're now a naturalized U.S. citizen Yes. How do we get people that are U.S. citizens to get off their butts and do something <laughs> when you come from another country and and just are doing everything? Well, you know, that's the thing is that that's kind of outside of firearms. Immigration is the other big issue that I write about and focus on and speak about. And, um, you know, kind of overall, I think my message really comes down to the fact that, like, the American dream isn't dead. It's become a lot harder in the past few years for one reason or another. Um, you know, I was ranting to a friend. I was like, you know, just talking about the state of the Republican Party and just our politics as a whole. And I'm like, you know, I definitely think uh, I had a little bit more hope of 
my future and, you know, my husband were just on the verge of getting married two years ago and just kind of seeing everything that's happened in the country in the past two, three, four years um, has definitely made the American dream a lot harder, but it's still out there. Um, and I think that's kind of, like I said, another point that I really try to get out there is that, you know, success is out there. Like, I think the left likes to pretend, you know, they're the finite limit of success, fi finite limit of money and recognition and all those things that I guess, you know, other people will take as success. Um, you know, for me, I've always focused on how I can make the greatest impact, right? Like our time on this earth is limited. And so I kind of really want to maximize every second and hopefully I'm doing that. You know, I'm always kind of looking to see what I can do, but, um, you know, everybody always says, uh, you know, the old line of freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. And, you know, I think we'll dive into that a little bit more here today of, you know, how do we keep keep going, you know, build on, you know, I kind of feel like shoulder, standing on the shoulders of giants like you guys. And, you know, Rebecca Schmo, she's another one of our great friends that's kind of in between that media and Second Amendment and political space. And, um, you know, like I said, those of us that are in the space, I think we definitely know each other pretty well. But uh there are a few, there are quite few of us, which is nice because it's definitely a community, but, um, you know, there's always room. And that's one thing that I've even kind of discovered in my full-time job. I'm like, well, you know, we're a conservative media outlet. Okay. There's like hundreds more like us. We're a second amendment media. Okay. You know, there's 25 more like us, but we found a niche. I mean, I've been a part of the team for uh, over a year actually now, full time. I came on full time last August, um, and I was freelancing for about six months for the company before I came on full time. So, you know, really in the past two years, we've seen an exponential growth in hiring of staff, and you know, page views and revenue and ad load and all those great things that, again, um, you know, there's a great capitalist system like we enjoy here in the United States. There's kind of a, a piece of the pie that's there for everybody, and you know, you might need to elbow people out of the way a little bit sometimes to get your piece, but um, you know, like I said, I, I think that piece is always out there to, to go out and get it. Uh, and, you know, that, that's pretty personal to me. Um, my parents are from the Soviet Union. They worked their butts off to come here to be able to raise me and my sister uh, in America. Um, and then my husband is an immigrant as well. He came uh, in his collegiate years. Um, and, you know, he's kind of for both of us uh, kind of being involved in politics and especially mentoring the next generation. Um, I know you just recently had on the show my good friend Lyra. I was a mentor of hers through the Fund for American Studies program this past summer. Um, so, you know, for us, like coming to D.C. with really no connections, that's really something that we try to pass along. And, you know, it, it obviously helps if people are like minded. Uh, that definitely kind of helps elevate that relationship. But, um, you know, we've mentored a couple students and we have just over the past few years and we've just really seen them go on and do great things. And, um, you know, one I helped set up with her next internship after the program, one's looking to come out to back out to D.C. after being gone for a couple years. So, um you know, kind of talking about impact earlier, I think there's just so many different ways that you can impact. And even if you can't be there, if there's kind of a, a little part of you that somebody can take along into whatever they're doing next, I think that's very impactful as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, we've talked sort of around this already a little bit, but just yeah. to drive the point home, um, how did a, a nice girl like you immigrate to the United States and find herself writing specifically about our second amendment, our right to keep and bear arms. Yeah, so there's definitely, a, it, it was a, a journey coming to that point. Uh, I'll say I've been involved in politics probably um, for about half my life now, since about early high school, late middle school is kind of when I took an interest in the political space, was involved in debate and things like that in high school, knew I kind of wanted to pursue a career in even collegiate studies along the, you know, political science journalism realm. Um, so I looked at schools that were good in that. That's how I found myself at the University of Kansas, uh, while also being a student athlete, which I was in college. Um, you know, kind of everything came together and that's the school that I ended up at. It's a, you know, top 10, top 20 journalism school, depending on kind of what ranking you look at. So, um, you know, kind of, I, I've always had a, a passion for storytelling. Uh, always kind of known I was definitely not on the left, um, kind of given my family background. I've kind of wavered between more libertarian, more conservative, Republican uh, ideologies, I think, a little bit. Um, really growing up, I thought all government was bad and terrible <laughs> because, again, having your parents grow up in a system where the government was really all-knowing, all-controlling uh, gives you kind of a, a healthy distrust of authority, I think, as, as people say nowadays, at least. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
that's definitely kind of the beginnings of my ideological, uh, just kind of where I found myself ideologically. Um, but actually it was the immigration issue, which again is one that's very personal to me because it took my family 11 years to get citizenship. So we immigrated when I was three years old and um, became citizens when I was 14. Um, so kind of as somebody that's been through the immigration system, I remember I went to one conference that was, uh, I believe it was like a Students for Liberty conference. And I went to the immigration panel because again, that's something that I was very interested in. and. Uh, there was a, I believe he was like a university professor and he was talking about, oh, you know, one world open borders. And I'm like, wait, wait, no, 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 no. Like, this isn't me. I got to leave. Like, I don't believe any of this. Um, and I'm sure that's something that you guys see living where you live in Arizona. Oh my gosh. Like, um, you know, again, as I was talking about before, I think that the American dream should be here and be available for anybody that wants to go pursue it, whether you're born here or not. Uh, I think really anybody can come here and make something of themselves in this country. Um, you know, my dad was raised by a single mom in Ukraine. Uh, his dad, uh, his dad died when he was three. So um, that's, you know, my grandma, she was in the STEM field. So very kind of uh, a woman, I think wise beyond her years and kind of beyond her generation a little bit. Um, actually both of my grandmas ironically kind of were in the STEM fields. Uh, which again, kind of talk about like politics and media in places where I am, where I think women are traditionally kind of carving their path. I think even though I'm not doing it in the same way that they did, I think they've kind of passed along their, uh, I don't know what it is, perseverance or, or something along those lines um, to, you know, just kind of th through the bloodstream, through the genealogy, however, however it is. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of when I decided I was definitely not a libertarian because they were all open borders. Uh, it was during that that session, I remember. Um, and then so, you know, I kind of always got involved in uh, politics. I was involved in college Republicans in college, ended up serving as the state chair for Kansas one year. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't really have anything like special. Like, you know, I was just one of those, you know, college Republicans, showed up to meetings, like might do a campaign here, or there, you know, and turn on the hill, blah, dee, da. Um, but then in Kansas, where I went to college, we had a, a big campus fight and kind of being, uh, you know, just being who I am and even really like since my days of being an athlete and things like that, I was always taught to never back down from a fight. <laughs> <laughs> so w when that fight came along and that fight was concealed carry on college campuses, I knew that kind of being a, a conservative voice and wanting to be that for the next, um, you know, really even amongst my peers and to make sure that gun rights uh, were secure on campus, I knew that I had to speak out and find my voice. So that's really when I came, uh, I like to say I came home for the first time uh, to the Second Amendment community. So I was in college from 2016 to 28, or sorry, 2015 to 2018. Um, so I believe 2015 was the year that Kansas's campus carry bill was passed and then it wasn't implemented until 2017. There's two year implementation period, a lot of pushback. Uh, from college students, faculty, um, you know, activist groups, uh, really just shouting down that they didn't want guns on campus. It was going to cause mass carnage, um, right. which they always say uh, that. Yes, they always say, you know, everybody's going to be dying left and right. They're going to, um, you know, these terrible things are going to happen. Blood uh, in the streets is what right. they always exactly. say. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and again, I was like, these are our rights that are ingrained in our fabric as Americans, they're ingrained within our constitution. I was like, they, like these people are crazy. Like, I gotta say something. Um, so that's really, again, kind of when I started speaking and writing specifically on the Second Amendment issue, uh, got to know some great folks, um, you know, Kansas State Rifle Association. I know you guys know some of those folks there very, very well. Uh, yeah. They have definitely were kind of supportive of my journey really from day one. Um, I held a great uh, speaking event on campus through my college Republicans club, Antonia Okafor. Again, I know somebody yes. that Second Amendment community knows uh, very, very well. Um, I had an event of like 80 people when she came to my campus and she was kind of starting, I think, to get like very big. Like she was already starting to do some speaking, but hadn't quite reached her like crest of her success, I guess, back then is kind of how I would say it. Um, and again, just bringing her to campus was like very controversial. And I was like, no, like, you know, again, talking about preserving gun rights for the next generation and, you know, people that don't look even like you and I do, like, she's very, very good at that. And I think even now with the roles that she has, she focuses very much on, um, you know, bringing new gun owners, younger gun owners, female gun owners into the space. And so 
uh, I kind of saw what she was doing and I knew that I had to give that a platform however way that I could. So um, kind of did that, spoke at some Second Amendment events. Uh, and then um, I think kind of the first like national incident that I was involved in was I actually uh, tattled to, to the press through an op-ed uh, about a professor of mine who um, he was, so I was taking global and international studies classes. So I had to take some studies on uh, like Eastern history and things like that. So I had this class that I was taking, it was a class on the history of the samurai. Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily your uh, nicest, most diplomatic people, right? Lots of bloodshed, gore, etc. cetera, um, within that whole part of history. Um, so I show up to class on the first day and this is uh, 2017. Um, again, kind of campus carry came to campus and in the syllabus, this professor said, don't come visit me in office hours if you're going to be carrying a firearm. And I was like, Whoa. uh, well, the, the constitution tells me I can carry on campus. The state tells me I can carry on campus. Like who the heck are you to tell me that I can't carry in your office during office hours? And that's kind of when I got very, very deeply into this debate of like, my gun rights don't end at the schoolhouse door, um, you know, especially at the age of 18, 19, 20, when you're in college, uh, you're an adult, right? Like <laughs> looking at some people my age and a little bit younger, they don't really act like adults, but like the law treats you like an adult. Mm -hmm. um, and so Campus Curry was only from the age of 21, which is kind of another, I think, uh, element of it that the left likes to say, well, like nobody's going to be affected by it. You know, by that point, you're like off campus. You don't live on campus. You barely come to campus. Why do you need it? You're there like three hours a day. Um, and I was like, well, exhibit a like you know if i'm taking your class from six to nine o'clock at night and i'm walking back through half of campus um you know in the dark and like the point that i always to kind of harken back to was i was in student senate and our meetings sometimes would get out at midnight one o'clock two a.m in the morning and the union was about 20 minutes away from the dorms and so i'd walk across campus in the middle of the night because especially like freshman year i didn't have a car how else was I going to get there? The buses, I think, stopped running at midnight, right? So, like, it was my own two feet was how I was going to get get back. Um, and, you know, thankfully, nothing ever happened to me. But, you know, as a, as a young woman walking back all the way across campus at night, that's a, that's not a good situation to be in. And so I, I wish, you know, personally, uh, kind of my more radical uh, ideology is that, you know, I think anybody 18 and up should be able to carry. Um, but we're not quite You're there an yet. Adult. You're an adult. You're an adult. Exactly. Right. So that, that's my that's my radical right winger coming out there. But um, <laughs> and so, you know, again, I think even with everything that we've done nationally on both constitutional carry and campus carry. If I was president of the United States, which I never can be because I wasn't born in this country, but if I was, I would say 18 and up, you're an adult. We're going to treat you like one. Um, and makes you know, sense that's to that. me. Makes right. sense to me. Uh, I was 18 when we got married. I was a homeowner. I was a business owner. I would do the bank drop every night by myself. And I wasn't legally allowed to, you know, arm myself. That made no sense to me yeah. at all. It makes less sense to me the, the older I get looking back. Because everybody <laughs> was wants to say, well, you know, those 18 year old kids, well, I could have been sued in a court of law, right? I was signing contracts as an adult, mm -hmm. but yet you know, there's this weird velvet rope around certain rights that I'm not, I don't have access to it just doesn't make sense to me. I, so I it doesn't make sense to me either. Never has. And, um, you know, kind of the other thing that I even talked about now was like, especially in this day and age with everything that's going on on college campuses, so many people aren't going to college. So it's, you know, the day you turn 18, you're an adult, you know, people get jobs as truck drivers, right. Making a hundred thousand plus a year. Mm -hmm. and those people, their gun rights that's another thing I've been looking into it's crazy because some of them don't even have like a permanent residence to kind of apply for their mm. gun permit like they don't have a state where they're kind of permanently grounded because they're always on the road um you know like van life right like that's one of these things that's popping off with my generation it's you know what if you don't have a physical address where did where do they send your gun permit mm. to me it should be national blanket law 18 you're good well I don't think the constitution like says anything. anything about 18 years old does it does it say that you had to be an adult? No, there's no age in the, the Constitution. Constitution. So you're right. It's just we the people. 
but we've <laughs> decided as a society that you're magically an adult at 18, but, but if you're, you're only magically an adult for certain things, you can go fight for your nation. You're still right? violating my constitutional right. If I'm 18 years old, I want to buy a gun and you won't let me buy a gun. Thank you. I don't care what it says. You, Thank you. you know, I appreciate that. You either follow the constitution or you don't, just... governor of New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh yeah that woman's definitely crazy well and you know just as a quick side tangent like you know we have like i live just outside of washington dc we have 13 14 year olds committing armed carjackings yeah mm -hmm. right i wish those people were being tried as adults because they're yes. committing crimes that they should be yeah. punished like adults but yeah. kind of on the other hand you know if i'm 18 even in high school and my 13 year old, you know, underclassman's trying to carjack me. I want to have my gun. So, yeah. and exactly in DC, there's people that carjack with guns that aren't charged with the criminal, uh, with a uh, firearm. They're charged with the, yeah. the, the other crime. The Carjacking, other crimes, they, yeah, they're not. They drop the gun charges for some yeah. magic reason. So, so they can pile up more gun charges <laughs> and change the laws, right? Yeah. All right, moving on. Next question. <laughs> well, we have, we, I know. I was like, a, I can go on about that forever. <laughs> we, had a, we had a gun shop and the store got broken into and they stole, a, a, a kid under 18 stole some guns. And one of the guns he stole was a class three weapon. Well, I said weapon, firearm. but it's not. It's a firearm. Uh, and uh, they caught the guy. They didn't charge him for that because he was under 18. Right. But he that's was what they said he, acting on behalf of somebody who was older than but 18 but it doesn't matter he stole it. a class three firearm and he was under 18 and they didn't charge him because he was under 18 yeah mm -hmm. it makes no sense no the crime the damage was done the crime was done right nobody paid for it except for us as the business owner so yeah. that was fun yeah. anyway moving on. <laughs> um, let's on let's go so talk to us about um our, our Second Amendment rights, as far as how younger Americans interact with them. Um, many say that once our generation ages out, um, otherwise known as, you know, kind of dies off, right? Um, that the anti-gun folks are going to have no future resistance. They're just going to march all, march in and and uh, rewrite the Second Amendment and and delete the Second Amendment. And, and there's a lot of people that really believe that, that once we are gone, like we're the last guard. Um, from your experience, how true might that be? I mean, you know, it's it's definitely something that I think about a lot and something that does terrify me probably as equally as it does you, um, which is again, you know, why I'm kind of grateful to ha have a platform, be developing a platform and hopefully grow it even bigger and bigger to connect with folks that are more my age or maybe even a little bit younger, uh, that you know our constitution has persisted for almost 250 years. Like, we're not gonna get rid of it now. Now, on the other hand, we are ironically kind of one of the younger countries just in terms of mm -hmm. every single country that's ever existed. We do have one of the youngest constitutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, obviously we've changed it a little bit through the amendment process, uh, but I think the, the modern left here in America is just trying to take it way too, too far. Um, and the thing that really scares me is that so many of them aren't studying history. Like when I was, uh, you know, in college, um, I think either my class or maybe the class before they got rid of a Western civilization requirement uh, mm -hmm. for humanities graduates. Because, um, oh, wow. you know, they said it's, you know, it's, it's all history about white people and it doesn't matter. And, uh, you know, it's sure I'm totally fine with learning about other cultures, but you live in a Western democracy, so you need to understand how we got here. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people aren't learning about that. They're not learning about the Holocaust. They're not learning about, you know, yes, I think uh, some people do kind of paint with a wide brush and kind of brush over the, the uglier parts of American history. And I think those do need to be in there. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, education curriculum reform is something that folks are working on in the left and the right to tell kind of a more complete picture of our history, both as, as a species and as a country. But I think just kind of blanket, throwing it out and tossing it in the dump, that's not serving anybody uh, very well. Um, and, you know, as everybody always says, you know, history will repeat itself like if we don't know it. And so uh, for me, you know, studying Again, kind of coming from a country of, of socialism and communism and, you know, now it's a little bit more free market or it, it was, I'd say, for about 15 years. Now, I think 
Russia and the former Soviet states are going backwards a little bit over the past few years. But, um, you know, even in those states, they made so many developments throughout different leaders that they've had to open themselves up more to the Western world. And uh, again, like I said, kind of with the caveat of it's changed over the past couple of years. But, um, you know, I, I grew up going back to Russia every single summer, pretty much growing up. And I would kind of watch it become more and more westernized every year that I would go back. Uh, and it was fascinating to watch, um, again, because, you know, we learned about countries that have been built uh, really from the ground up, even over the past hundred years. And I've always learned about it in history, but I've never really watched it happen before my own eyes. And so that's really kind of given me a perspective, which I know is unique. I know lots of other people, um, you know, even people that I've met uh, over the past five years, you know, living in the Midwest, for example, like they've never even left their home state. A whole lot of them have never even left the country. Um, mm -hmm. And so kind of talking about different diverse experiences that I've had that have really informed my opinions on X, Y, and Z, again, I think is so crucial because mm -hmm. there is so much meaning behind why I believe what I believe. And so, uh, you know, again, I think so many times, like here in DC, people are kind of an expert on one issue or maybe two. And we fail very often, I think, to see the whole picture, which is why I kind of have so many different elements of my life that I like to bring into things like this is because I, I have a good reason. You know, you might not agree with my opinion, but like if you could at least kind of let me tell you how I got there, uh, maybe you'll be able to see it a little bit better is kind of how I look at it. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I want to see my own career and platform obviously grow and develop, but, you know, I'm, I know I'm not the only one, but I think there's probably a, only a handful of us that are doing work similar to what I'm doing. And so I, I want to see that grow and them grow and develop as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's important. Like I've always been, a, uh, you know, kind of as you're climbing up the ladder, make sure you reach down and help somebody that's on the rung below you. And but obviously also reach up because somebody's going to do that for you kind of thing. Um, and again, I, I think within the Second Amendment community, especially in the 2A media community, we're so good at that. Um, you know, I found some of my best friends and mentors uh, throughout, which is kind of why I said when, when I came back to the conservative media movement probably about a year and a half ago, um, you know, it, it really felt like I was coming home because these are people that I had known and kind of tangentially stayed connected with. Um, and, you know, that you guys obviously are a huge part of that. And just I know a couple of our mutual friends are as well is really investing in that next generation because, mm. you know, like I said earlier, none of us are going to be here around forever. So we have to make sure, yes, of course, obviously invest in yourself. Like you want to have yourself be successful because, again, you know, we're we're capitalists and we all want to, to be on top. But, you know, being on top doesn't mean pushing the other person off the cliff. Thank um, you for that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that. Um, not to jump into a completely different thing, but that's <laughs> how I've, I've thought about, uh, the idea of feminism for many, many years. It's like for somehow we went from, you know, let's, let's empower women. Let's, you know, cheerlead women to now, well, women are good because men are bad. Wait, what? No. You know, like there's that, <laughs> that idea of, um, and I think you, you were saying this earlier on that, um, the scarcity principle, is what drives so much of this. Like there's only so much to even be had. And so we're fighting over space instead of realizing that the more of us, the the greater the opportunity that we can create. Um, so I, I love that idea. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so you live in Virginia, I but do. I've noticed that you have written several articles about one of our Arizona Senate candidates and somebody that we consider a friend of ours, Sheriff Mark Lamb of Pinal County here in Arizona. What What's that connection that you have um, all the way from Virginia in your publication to um, Sheriff Lamb's campaign? Yeah, so we have uh, both the Republican Standards are Virginia outlet and American Liberty News is more national. Um, and kind of being a, a political animal at heart, which is what I've always been, is, you know, I'm looking to see how we can really change the course of this country in the next couple of years, right? Um, and so kind of being a Virginian, I think a lot of people look to us is to kind of see where the the bellwether, the trends are, you know, obviously we have elections every year, uh, which is, is definitely fun. Like I said, it kind of keeps me busy outside of my full-time job for sure. Um, 
but you know, kind of looking at states like Virginia, I think when we look at a path back to the the Senate, control of the Senate, uh, Virginia is definitely a key state in that, um, as are a couple of others, which in my mind, you know, including Arizona. Arizona didn't have Democrat senators until a couple of years ago. Historically, mm-hmm. Arizona's always had Republican senators. Yeah. So, you know, when I look at key pickup opportunities to see how we can get some votes uh, you know, hopefully to go along with a great new presidential agenda, but at least if we can, if again, magically, if somehow we could at least pick up some of these Senate seats, even if we don't take back the White House for some reason. Um, you know, I look at Arizona and as somebody that cares again about the two issues that I talked about, immigration, Second Amendment, those are my two issues. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different, again, kind of talking about piece of the pie. The Republican platform is a very big pie. But for me, when I go out to vote, especially in a primary, uh, I look at who's going to protect my gun rights and who's going to secure our borders. Um, And so kind of, again, tangentially related to politics. But in my free time, I love kind of consuming content that supports that. And so uh, my husband and I have both watched 60 Days In and Live PD, which Mark Lamb was on uh, previous iterations of those shows. Uh, You know, really over the past five years, he's really made a name for himself. Um, And again, kind of with those being my two issues, I also uh, tangentially through my media work cover a lot of the law enforcement community as well. And so kind of him being a sheriff kind of ties into that. Um, And so, again, kind of when I look at people that are going to fight for the things that I believe in in the U.S. Senate, Mark Lamb is the top of my list. And the fact that he's a targeted race, we're writing a lot about him. Uh, So I first got to interview him at the Feet to Fire Conference, uh, FAIR, Federation for American Immigration Reform. They're a great immigration advocacy, you know, pro strong borders, pro following the law. Uh, You know, they work a lot with constitutional sheriffs and things like that. Um, So they had a a media event, which actually you guys should, if you guys haven't been, you guys should definitely go. It's primarily for radio and podcasters. So you guys are kind of the prime uh, target for that. But I was there as print media, kind of grabbing some interviews with people off the side. And uh, I sat down with Mark um, at that point just to kind of get his thoughts. And, you know, uh, being in a border state of Arizona, I know his county specifically isn't a border county, but it's uh, I believe it's uh, I-35 that runs through his um, county. Uh, so, you know, everything that all the problems that are coming across the border, he sees that day in and day out in his work. So, Mm-hmm. Um, I, at the time I interviewed him, I guess this was almost a year ago now, uh, really kind of on the the Biden border agenda. Because again, I hear about it a lot from D.C. and you know from people that worked in the Trump administration. They're like, well, we had X, Y, and Z going, but Biden's completely flipped that on his head. Um, and again, that's good. Obviously, messaging that comes out of think tanks and things like that, it definitely h- helps drive a part of the national conversation. Mm-hmm. But again, I feel like we are so often, especially in the media, not talking about people that are in it day in and day out. So right. um, I was very excited when I got a chance to interview Mark about it, because uh, I'd also been to some events with FAIR um, where they had even had some of our Virginia sheriffs come out. And they're like, you know, with the situation at the border, like, like every county is a border county. You know, we have MS-13 gang violence in Virginia within an hour of where I live mm-hmm. because the border is so weak that the drugs, the illegal gun trafficking, things like that, they come across the border and they really infiltrate every single community. Um, And so if we see that here in Virginia, like what is it like to somebody that is just an hour or two away? You know, everything that comes up here has to come from somewhere and it has to come through somewhere. And uh, Pinal County is that somewhere. And again, kind of as audiences have seen, I think over the past several years on shows like Live PD and 60 Days In, uh, they're dealing with some of these very hardened criminals that are coming across the border and they're getting locked up in places like Pinal County. Um, and so that was kind of the first time that I, I interviewed Mark and I've been covering his race kind of, uh, I guess it was actually one of your guys' events. Uh, he announced it was the, the Freedom Riders Rally uh, that he was going to be seeking a seat in the U.S. Senate. So I was very excited about that. So I covered that event. Um, and again, I think you guys might have I'm I've seen it a little bit better uh, because you guys probably elevated some of that and what happened at that event. Um, And, you know, now that he's both a a media personality, but also he actually works in the industry himself and he's a candidate. I know he's on national news all the time. Uh, Mm -hmm. Again, talking about these issues that I feel like definitely don't get enough coverage from somebody that lives and breathes them every single day. Um, And so, 
again, kind of in terms of what I'm watching, both in terms of a state that we can take back, but also on issues that I care about, because you know, I want the Senate to vote to secure the border. I want the Senate to, you know, let states take control of Second Amendment rights. And mm-hmm. who's going to be that that 50th or 51st vote? It's hopefully it's going to be Mark Lamb. That would, uh, you know, from your lips to God's ears, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> because um, even though the candidate he's trying to unseat um, Kirsten Cinema, she has moved her or changed her affiliation from Democrat to independent, but she's behaving just like she was as a Democrat. Oh, um, absolutely. You know, she's not friendly to the Second Amendment. And so I'm very excited um, for the opportunity to see somebody who is a true public servant who has shown himself uh, through all these years to be a public servant to, to get in there. Um, so thank you for your work on that. <laughs> thank you. Did you have the next question? No, no go ahead. Oh, okay. He's going to let me run with it. Okay. <laughs> um, what does the future hold for our title of this show, conservative journalism in general, but specifically for the field you're in, there's so much liberal pushback, there's demonetizing, there's, you know, so much in the way that in some ways, you know, there's people that are built like us, that rebel spirit, like tell us we can't and we're gonna, you know, (laughs) um, but I think there's too many other people out there that have just turned into little bobblehead dolls that they just go along with whatever. And they're, they're not seeking around the corners for information that's maybe being withheld from them. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Just as we start wrapping up. So somebody that went to journalism school, I figured out very quickly that I did not want to be in in the mass media uh, for a number of different reasons, um, but kind of one of them being that I know certain beliefs that I hold, and I know that that I'm kind of going to use that, not necessarily just to spread that everywhere, even though I think uh, it's needed, especially in my generation, but kind of seeing like these things that I know are important, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find the truth, like you mentioned, about those things, and I'm going to share it. And um, you know, I'm I'm going to kind of work within a framework that is very personal to me. And some people would say that's kind of not the job of a journalist. It's to be completely objective. But, you know, I come into the situation saying, like, these are my biases. And I'm going to work with that as my framework. And then within that, like, I will tell your side of the story. I'm also going to tell you why it's stupid, but I'll include it. <laughs> um But again, I think that there's just so much that the mainstream media doesn't tell uh, Mm -hmm. that I I really knew I couldn't be a part of it. And, you know, there's that video clip that keeps going around of, I think it was during COVID of, you know, every single major network uh, host saying like the exact same lines about this, that, and the other. And that really instilled in me that I made the correct decision to Mm -hmm. (laughs) really not be a part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of part one. Uh, Part two is that I'm very fortunate to have the employer that I do where, you know, kind of as a publication, we are center right, right of center identifying. But within that, especially through our contributors that we publish, we are a very big tent. So, you know, you can find a commentator that you agree with on maybe foreign policy, but not domestic policy or domestic policy and not foreign policy or you know what they write something good about the federal government but you don't like what they write about the state government and vice versa so we really um and i think you know even looking at things like the 2024 presidential primary i think we have so many publications that have really put themselves in a camp of one or the other but as a publication you know most of the things that i write and edit you know they have the disclaimer there like these aren't the views of the publication but we pretty much give people an open forum to share their beliefs um and i I think that's very valuable and i'm gonna hold on to that as long as i can because this is really kind of my my dream work environment (laughs) uh to to be in where you know i can be myself and i have the support and the framework to kind of publish those ideas um, and really kind of see them grow and develop and be a part of a team that grows and develops month after month and that's very rewarding um you know even on our site we have certain things that you know get flagged and they're demonetized by google and that's like the number one way that you make money from advertising and so 
there's definitely certain pages that we don't make ad revenue from, even though it might be getting tens of thousands of eyeballs. Yeah. Um, and that is kind of something that you have to consider and figure into your overall fr framework. And um, also, I think a lot of conservative publications are actually primarily on the nonprofit space. And so uh, we are a for-profit company. And so, you know, again, at the end of the day, like people have bills to pay and mouths to feed. And so um, how to make money while also doing what you love is so hard. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. thankfully I have a very uh, kind of well-established editorial team that has dealt with some of these things and they kind of help us navigate these rough, rough waters, especially in this day and age. But, um, you know, that's kind of why I think at least for now, I'm definitely not going to go off and do something completely on my own because I don't really know how I would, you know, keep the lights on uh, <laughs> without kind yeah. of that framework and that infrastructure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's so many left wing, especially personalities that get millions and millions funded through, you know, different groups or DNC or companies and their spokespeople and their you know, they're not public about it, but when you look into things like donation records and, you know, who pays who and who's, who is whose management company, that's when you really start, again, to see the truth and saying, do you really believe this? Or are you just doing it because you're getting paid $1,000, $5,000, $10,000 for all these videos that you're making? And, right. you know, for some people, that's the way they want to operate. But for me, if I say it, I believe in it personally. So I love that. Uh, you know, well, I, we need... A million more like you. <laughs> we do. And you've, you've started that. Like you said, you've mentored up um, one particular that we met uh, on this show, Lyra Penaregan, I think. Penaregan, yeah. Penaregan. Penaregan. <laughs> she laughed because she's like, you know what? My na last name is so hard to pronounce. I don't even pronounce it right. And I was like, that's <laughs> Grace. That was Grace right there from her. Um, but you, so you're doing your part to pass the baton on to the next generation. And that is everything. Well, we thank you. I mean, you are as well. So <laughs> it's you. generation by generation, it gets passed along. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, we do need to wrap up. Will you please tell folks, uh, how do they follow all of the amazing work that you do? Is there like a hub for everything or are there multiple, uh, websites and social media pages? Yeah, so I am pretty much on every single platform, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So just searching my name is a good start. Victoria Snitzar Churchill, I go by my full name uh, on most things. Um, I'd say my Twitter page, or X, I guess, as it's known now, uh, that is kind of a hub, I think, where I said share the most content. Um, but And anytime I do have an, an appearance or, you know, even this video, I'm sure I'll share it kind of to everything. Uh, but I do try to diversify streams of content a little bit. So if you want the complete biggest picture, follow me on everything and I'll love you forever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> love that. Uh, but yes, th that is social media. And then um, my work again, primary employer is American Liberty News. Um, and then I kind of freelance all over. But again, probably Twitter would be the best place to find that. Uh, so yeah, Victoria Snitz or Churchill handle on Twitter and Instagram is snitz underscore churchy. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. We will definitely check back in with you in the future. Thank you guys so much for having me. It was a great fun and I hope to be back soon. Bye. Yes. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. You. Bye-bye. Wow. She is so great. I just love her. And um, where do you get that energy from? I know. I want some. And where do we get more energy? young people like that with the, you know, to, to have a free mind instead of a programmed mind. Exactly. And you know what? She's so generous because, you know, I've, I've started writing for, um, as a visiting fellow for the independent women's forum. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I announced that she was like such a big cheerleader, she was like so excited and she started sharing my work and then tagging other people saying, share Cheryl's work. And I was like, that's, that's awesome that is what we need, right? Just more people helping each other, um, lifting each other up. I like that analogy of the ladder, you know, you reach down, but you also reach up for yeah. help. So beautiful. All right. Well, thank you again to our amazing guest, Victoria Snitzar Churchill. Great name, by the way, Churchill, right? Um, and uh, to all of our amazing listeners and viewers, wherever 
Dan, there is internet on this planet, on the entire globe. We can tra track our analytics and we can see that we have viewers and listeners. Everywhere. Which, everywhere. Places where you would not expect or think. Exactly. And it goes so far beyond the borders of the United States. And that is because these things that we talk about here are timeless. They're timeless values. They're timeless hopes. Right? right dreams aspirations and uh so thank you so much to everybody who does tune in and if you want to go back and watch any portion of this video or any of our videos go to wherever you find your video content but specifically if you go to youtube where we have the tiniest numbers and i don't believe it i i believe that our numbers are just as strong there as they are in many other places but if you will um, subscribe and hit the notifications, then that bolsters us against that cancel culture and tells that platform that this is information that's right. valuable to the end user, which is you. So please do that. Also on um, GunStreamer, also subscribe and, and hit the notifications and OpsLens, which is a smartphone app. And if you want to just listen to the audio only, version because you're out on a bike ride or doing some chores around the house, then go to our website, gunfreedomradio.com. Click the on demand and binge listen to your heart's content, darling. But I don't understand why YouTube gets involved with this. Why don't the, why don't they let the people that listen and view make the decision on what they want to watch? Isn't that how why? it always was before around 2020? But, but yeah, and, yeah. and that's just, it's crazy because <clears throat> they'd get a bigger audience, which is more money for YouTube, the whole works. Yeah. Capitalism is I still said the key to safety. I, I'm not the key to safety, the key to freedom, I think. Um, and right. that'd be wonderful right. if we could go back to actually having true free speech, um, even speech you don't like, right? It's still, it should be free uh, to be um spoken and put out there all right so um did i already say about finding our guests there is a guest tab on our website and that has photos and bios and links to all the works of all the guests we've ever had on it's a tremendous resource and when you spend time there we don't hate that no, we don't. until next time we are going to pray for our nation what else are we going to do pray for our leaders what about the ones we don't like pray for them too especially them maybe, yes ma'am right? <laughs> I love that. Sir, yes, sir. All right. Uh, thank you guys so much. And until next time, be good to each other. Have a great week. Bye-bye.